Peace of Christ, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our Lenten journey. I trust that you and your families are doing well. Today we're going to talk about the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. And taking a little back from the cross, just back in history, we see the year 312 AD as a historical moment for the Roman Empire. Constantine the Great, as we know, was marching to meet his opponent Maximus, who had an army twice the size of his. He was nervous, aware of the great strength of that army. But the night before the war, we are told that he had a dream. And in that dream, he saw a cross with the words, by this sign, conquer. When Constantine woke up, he was perplexed, unable to fathom how something as weak, so gruesome as a cross could give him victory. But Constantine obeyed the voice pitched a large cross in the middle of the battlefield. The two armies invaded, God intervened, and Constantine won the victory. The cross, brothers and sisters, is not foreign to any of us. If you're really honest, we will admit that somehow the cross has become a commonplace in our lives. Because we see it everywhere, there's a tendency for us to forget what happened at the cross. In ancient times, if we gathered around the cross, they would think we lost our minds because the cross was hellish punishment reserved for the vilest sinners. People suffered for hours, even days there. They were left hanging alone, crucified, their flesh hanging out due to the intensive flogging, bones visible, body being drained of blood and vultures lurking in the sky. We can use our imagination there. Jerusalem became like a carnival party during crucifixion as the criminal was made to walk very slowly to the main public square for the whole world to see who he was. Excruciating pain. That word excruciating defines pain at its peak at the highest levels and it comes from the Latin word excruciatus which means the cross, the cross. And Jesus endured this pain. Why? Because of you and me, because of love, because of sin. Brothers and sisters, we will never understand the horror of the cross until we understand that God is holy, that God cannot tolerate sin, and that sin must be fixed if we are to inherit eternal life. Bishop Baron puts it very accurately, he says, Jesus on the cross, we tend to domesticate him sometimes. We tend to sanitize this image that we see. But Jesus on the cross, he is a cosmic warrior, come to do battle with the forces of darkness and all that keeps us from coming to the light. Brothers and sisters, it is war on the cross. Satan's whole plan is disarmed in the stripping of this man who willfully gives himself away for our sake. It is God who makes a way, not by sending a perfect angel or a holy prophet, because our sin is first and foremost against God himself. It's the highest offense, and it can only be fixed by the highest sacrifice, God himself. We call that in theology the great substitution this great exchange, a switching of the innocent for the guilty. Jesus receives what we deserve, death. We receive what is his eternal life. Sometimes it feels like we're juggling a math equation. But think about the agony in the garden when Jesus pleads, Father, if you're willing, take this cup away from me. What cup is this? It's the cup of judgment. It's the cup of wrath meant to be poured on me, but now poured on him. Scripture says, he who knew no sin eternally becomes the embodiment of sin, carrying our sin on his body, paying the price that we could never pay on our own. If Satan knew the secret of the cross, he would have never allowed Jesus to die on a cross. 
brothers and sisters, it is war on the cross. War for your soul and my soul. And God wins this war because love wins. Jesus didn't die to make God love us. Jesus died because God loves us. That is why someone like St. Paul, who was a murderer of the Christians, he could say, oh, all that you may comprehend with all the saints, all that you may comprehend with all the saints, the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the love of God in Christ Jesus. What is Paul talking about? He's talking about the cross. Think about it for a moment now. The breadth of the cross expanding as far as east is to the west. Every country, every nation, that's you, that's me. Whoever you are, regardless of your race, regardless of your ethnicity, even regardless of your religion. Think about the length of the cross. Scientists are still investigating the length of the galaxies, the complexity of the stars and the universe. But far beyond the stars, brothers and sisters, God has made a way for earth to touch heaven through the blood of his son. Heaven today is not out of reach because of the cross of Jesus Christ. A few weeks ago, I was counseling this young boy and after confession of this horrific sin he had committed, he said to me, I cannot undo this. I cannot fix the damage that I've done. And then we began to pray and I said to him, you pray and I'll intercede in the background. And he began praying. And right in the middle of prayer, he stopped. And he said to me, Michelle, I have no right to ask for this mercy. I cannot demand the mercy of God. And I had to remind him at that moment that God's mercy is unmerited, it's unearned, poured out on the cross of Jesus Christ, not when we were right, brothers and sisters, but when we were still his enemies. When he heard this, he began to weep like a child. Then there's the depth of the cross. Where are you at this moment? Struggling with your sins, struggling with addictions? Are you unable to get over the horror of the past? Satan loves to remind us of sin, isn't it? He labels us. You're a murderer. You're a thief. You're a rapist. You're an adulterer. You're a liar. You're a cheat. You're a gossiper. You're a manipulator. In the cross of Jesus Christ, God has another label for us. You are my son. You are my daughter. Jesus does not rewind the past, he redeems it through the cross. Think about the first person who entered paradise with Jesus. It is not even John the Beloved, the only person who had courage to stand at the foot of the cross when all his friends deserted him. It's not him, it's the thief on the cross. If only, brothers and sisters, we have the courage like the thief to utter the same words, Jesus remember me jesus remember me in 2017 it was one of my close friends her six week year old baby was diagnosed with lch lch is a very rare sickness it's not directly into the category of cancer but has got a lot of correlation with cancer a very rare sickness occurring in one out of 200,000 babies the survival rate is about 50%. And this child, just one month into the vaccination, post that, endured multiple surgeries, 25 chemo sessions, constant poking of needle in a day, losing his hair, and the list goes on. And sleep and food and rest and normal life was non-existent for my friend. And one day, just beaten down by the sheer, utter exhaustion of suffering, she spoke to me and she just broke down and she said to me, Mish, I'm begging God to give me this suffering. I will take it. I will take it any day because I cannot bear to see my son suffering. On Good Friday, we see another parent looking at the tortured body of his son gasping for breath 
as he gives voice, uttering those words on behalf of those, us, you, me, who have crucified him there, saying, Father, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And I think about at that moment the supremacy of God, the lordship and the authority of God, this God who puts the stars in place and calls them by name, this God who can speak and command legions of angels to his rescue, does nothing for Jesus. Jesus suffers alone because it's either him or it's me. And there's a shadow that falls on Jesus as the eternal life of the Father's presence is extinguished from him. That is why he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Brothers and sisters, those are not just words of Jesus. That is also your voice. Jesus gives voice to our suffering on the cross. Jesus brings meaning to our suffering on the cross. I love how Pope Francis so beautifully puts it. He says, God on the cross, he doesn't give us platitudes to say, well, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Good luck with that. I'm really sorry. God on the cross doesn't give us those platitudes, but he accompanies us in our suffering. You see, when Jesus thirsts on the cross, it's the fulfillment of that prophecy in Psalms 59 verse 21. Even though his throat is parched with thirst, he refuses that vinegar. Why? Because that vinegar acts as a sedative. Jesus wanted to feel the totality of pain. Why? So that there could never be a moment in our life, brothers and sisters, where we can come and say, God, you are absent in my pain. You don't understand my pain. On the cross, Jesus represents you. Jesus represents me. On the cross, Jesus represents you who are despised and rejected. You who are victims of rape and abuse. You who are poor and weak and have no voice in the world system. You who have been betrayed and abandoned and misunderstood by friends. You who have had to dig dustbins to feed your children. You who are sold as slaves for pleasure. Jesus gives voice to the unborn children slaughtered under the brutality of abortion. Cardinal Cantalamasa says it accurately. The greatest man in history was one of you. And brothers and sisters, that is our hope. That is our hope during this Lenten journey. Suffering is a mysterious thing. I have had innumerable suffering in my life. So many questions, such few answers. One thing I have learned, we don't always have the answers, but we have hope. We have hope. And the Christian hope, the Christian hope is not wishful thinking. The Christian hope is rock solid because it is rooted in a person not in circumstances, in a person who has loved us enough to carry his grave to the empty tomb. Because of the cross, death does not have the final word. Love does, brothers and sisters, and his love triumphs over all things. God's love can do the impossible in our life. I was sharing about my friend's son. His name is Kyle. The doctors had told them that if Kyle survives, even for one year, they should consider it as a great blessing. Kyle is going to be four years this year, completely free of LCH because of the power of the blood of Jesus on the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is healing to our bodies. And so now in this Lenten journey, as we are almost there, we're gonna enter the graphic journey of the Holy Week. What do we do with what we know? What do we do with the cross? Jesus said, if anyone wishes to follow after me, he must deny himself, pick up the cross and follow me. I instantly think of Peter. We all sympathize with Peter, don't we? His impulsive mouth had made him say, Jesus, I will follow you all the way. But he didn't realize that all the way ended at the cross. At the most crucial moments of Jesus' life, when Jesus needed his best friend the most, he abandoned him 
denied him in public and he fled from the cross afraid of his life and yet brothers and sisters this great sinner was chosen still chosen to tend to the people of God to feed the people of God this is what God's love does this is what God's love is it triumphs over failure we can never encounter the love of our Savior and remain unchanged, untransformed. And there amidst the charcoal fire, we know that seen so well after the resurrection, Jesus is sitting one-on-one -on -one with Peter. Charcoal fire is burning, but Peter's heart is burning brighter because of the tender gaze of his Savior friend before him, comforting him, assuring him, Peter, all is not lost. You can begin again. Behold, I make all things new. Peter, do you love me? More than possessions, more than security, more than your ideology of spirituality. Do you love me more than relationships, more than family, more than anything you hold dear? Do you love me? With his nail-pierced hands, this broken side, do you love me? Peter to go all the way. Scripture tells us that when Peter encountered the crucified Christ, his life was forever altered. History tells us that he requested the soldiers at his martyrdom to crucify him upside down because he said, I am not worthy to die like my master. That martyrdom gave us the Catholic Church with its legacy. What is your cross giving to the world? Where is Christ calling you to pick up your cross? Is it in the family? Is it in relationships, your marriage, perhaps as parents? Is it in the area of unforgiveness? Is it in sexuality? Is it in your finances? Is it in your career? Where is God calling you? Is it in, the, in your physical suffering? Perhaps for some of you, Listening today, you sense a deep call of God, a tug of Jesus calling you to follow Him. But you're afraid to say yes, afraid of the cross, afraid of what Jesus may demand. And I want to encourage you. Jesus demands nothing except love. Jesus withholds nothing except that which hinders true freedom. And so brothers and sisters, let us remind ourselves your life and my life has been bought with the price of the cross and that is not for private wins. Christianity is not for private consumption. You are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And the power of the cross in your life, the witness of the cross in your life is important because that witness is needed in this world. Your family needs that witness. Your schools and campuses need that witness. Your organizations need that witness. The church needs that witness. Your neighbors need that witness. The world needs that witness. And so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Jesus takes nothing from us. He can only give. And so I invite you right now to make that choice wherever you are. Accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and say, Lord, I give you my life. I don't understand. I'm afraid of the cross but I give you my life at this moment. So come, come to the cross. Don't be afraid. The power of the Holy Spirit helps us to come. He helps us to sustain the tragic circumstances of our life and to follow the cross of Jesus. And so come to the cross today. This is your place of victory, brothers and sisters. Come to that cross, come to that cross. Amen. God bless.